Have you ever been rejected? Do you struggle with rejection? Have you ever wondered how to overcome rejection? Then this is the episode for you. Welcome back to your hope-filled perspective, where it's always our goal to restore hope, renew minds, and empower listeners to live in their God-given identity. I'm your host, Dr. Michelle Bankson, and today we are going to be talking about how to overcome rejection. Scripture tells us in Deuteronomy 7, 6, for you are a people holy to the Lord your God. The Lord your God has chosen you out of all peoples on the face of this earth to be his people, his treasured possession. That's where we want to start off the conversation today. But first, let me introduce you to our guest today is Jessica Van Rokel. She's a worship leader, a speaker, and a writer who believes that through Jesus, personal histories don't need to define the present or determine our future. She inspires, encourages, and equips others to look at a life through the lenses of hope, trust, and God's transforming grace. Jessica lives in rural Iowa, surrounded by wide open spaces, which remind her of God's expansive love. She loves fun earrings, good coffee, and connecting with others. Welcome to the program, Jessica. Thank you, Michelle, for having me. I'm so glad to be here. I'm glad that you're here too, because I know how much I have personally struggled with rejection. And so if I've struggled, then I know that we have more than a couple listeners who also struggle. And what I've come to find out through interviewing so many people is that so often our ministry comes out of our own hurts and trials. So I'm curious where your passion for writing about rejection has come from. Well, it kind of blossomed as my 40th birthday present to myself. I looked in the mirror the day I turned 40 and I thought, am I seriously going to keep struggling with the same feelings of insecurity, the same feelings of rejection, the same struggles for the rest of my life? I thought, surely at 40, I should have it all together, or at least a little bit of it all together. And I just still felt like I was 20 years old and just striving to please everybody else, wanting people's approval, making them my pursuit of, of approval and making their opinions far too more powerful in my life than I really should have been. And so I just decided, okay, enough is enough. Obviously I have a problem with fear of rejection. I've allowed it to boss me around I've twisted myself into shapes and sizes that I don't really fit into, like a, a, a circular into a square peg or a square peg into a circular opening. And, and it just caused bruises to my heart and my spirit. And I would lose, I lost sight. And in fact, I don't even know if I truly knew who God intended me to be mm -hmm. because I was so caught up in fearing rejection from other people that I would do everything I could to please other people. And in that so doing, I, I turned 40 and I'm like, who are you? I don't even know who you are. So that's where my passion came from. And then I started observing myself and I started looking back at my past and then observing other people in our society. And I really realized that rejection is a thread that runs through our personal lives. It, we see it in the church. We see it in, in families. We see it, see it in our society. And I thought, Okay, if something so prevalent is here, what can we do to look at it in a different way? And so that's why I decided to really start writing about rejection. I like that the approach that you took was to attempt to look at it a different way. And we're going to talk about that a little bit more. But there's something that you mentioned a couple of times in sharing your own story, and that was a people-pleasing tendency and even to some degree, um, a tendency towards perfectionism. So yeah. can you talk a little bit about the impact of perfectionism and people pleasing on the fear of rejection? Because yeah. I think that some people may not even realize that they fear rejection, but they can see in themselves that they're either a perfectionist or that they're a people pleaser. So let's talk about how those intersect. Okay, I would love to. 
So I have always bristled when somebody says, oh, Jessica, you're such a perfectionist, because frankly, I, I love my stacks. I have my papers. You know, I have a high tolerance for clutter, and I really don't expect anybody else to be perfect around me. But because it bristled so often, I thought, OK, maybe I should look into this. And that's when I really realized that I used perfectionism, meaning I would try and be perfect. Not that I would, what I would do was perfect, but I would try and be the perfect um, ideal uh, for whatever somebody wanted. As, and I realized that I'm using perfectionism as a shield to protect me from rejection. I thought that if I was perfect in your eyes or the neighbor's eyes or you know my boss's eyes or my pastor's eyes, then I wouldn't experience rejection. But it wasn't true. You know, I still experienced rejection. And so, but this, this, this desire to be perfect, really at the core of that was my desire to please people. Mm -hmm. So first I had to really realize, okay, so I am chasing after people's opinions so much so that I'm twisting myself into a version of myself that I'm not even naturally good at. So for example, um, I had an English teacher in high school that I didn't even really like. I'll be really completely honest. <laughs> <laughs> but her opinion of, of me was so important that I just, when I learned that she valued de a person who was really detailed and really observational, I thought, okay, I'm going to be as detailed as I can be. I'm going to notice all the details. Well, details give me the headaches. Like you wouldn't believe. I'm like, Okay, you just gave me a list of things and it doesn't involve creating something fresh and new. Now you want me to do the details? Forget about it. But I was so determined to have her like me, even though I didn't like her. Doesn't that sound crazy to say that out loud? Mm -hmm. It sounds crazy. But I thought, okay, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to become a real detailed observational type person. So that was just one example. And then as I grew to be an adult, you know, if I found out that someone really liked analytical brains and I'd be like, okay, what does that mean to be analytical? I'm going to be analytical because I want you to like me. And so I would try and become this perfect version of what I thought was important to somebody else to protect myself from rejection. And it, it didn't really stop rejection from happening. So I'm just sitting here listening to you, resonating with so much of what you're saying. And it makes me wonder if we allow the fear of rejection, people pleasing and perfectionism to operate as an idol in mm. our lives. Yes, absolutely. Absolutely. It, it does operate as an if we're elevating someone else's desires and opinions to try to not be rejected. We're elevating their opinion more than God's opinion. Yes. In fact, Proverbs, I think 29, 25 says that fear of man is a snare. Yeah. And, and that's what it became to me, but not just a snare, but also an idol. And I believe Psalms 70 lists a description of what an idol is. It has eyes that cannot see, ears that cannot hear, a mouth that cannot speak. And, and that's what uh, chasing after people's opinions, trying to be perfect for them, created in me. It, I felt blinded. I couldn't see that God loved me. I was deaf. To the fact that he sang songs of delight over me in Zephaniah 317. And, and I, I had a mouth that, that I couldn't speak the good things of God over myself. I could speak them over other people, but I couldn't speak them over myself. I was a stone, if that makes sense. It like does. It does. And as I listen to you recount your story, it kind of creates a pit in mine because I remember having tendencies like that and you cannot please everyone. No. And if you're constant, so you were trying to please the English teacher, but then what about the band instructor? And then what about your parents? And then what about the youth leader? And they all prioritize different things and place different demands. 
Yes. Like it ties me up in knots just thinking about it. It was exhausting. Yeah. And and almost made me feel like I was all these different people, different versions of myself. And I, I didn't know who, who was Jessica. Yeah. Who did God create me to be? That Where was my so worth in sense. him? Let's talk a little bit about what are the different types or categories of rejection, because I don't think we hear about that enough. We just kind of lump it all in, in right. one big category. So talk yeah. about the different types. Okay. So the different types that we have are, I'll list them and then I'll describe each one. So the first one is actual rejection. The second one is perceived. The third one is unintentional rejection. And the fourth one is intentional rejection. So in the way I define them is actual rejection is, are the no's that we get when we apply for a job or we ask someone out on a date and they say no, or, you know, we invite someone over to coffee and they're like, no, sorry, doesn't going to work. Or we extend an invitation into someone's, um, for them to be a part of our life, whether through friendship or an acquaintanceship, and they say no. Those are our actual rejections. Those are just the things that happen in life where we get it, where we try something new and we get a no. And then we have the perceived rejection. And that's where you assume rejection. You assume you've already been rejected before you even walk into the room. So this, this stems from within ourselves. We, we're assuming that the person that we're going to be interacting with, say behind, as we walk into the meeting room, already doesn't like us. They've already rejected us. And we don't even know if that's true or not. So we assume the position of rejected. Now, unintentional rejection happens with misunderstandings or we, um, someone's careless words that mm -hmm. just strike us wrong. You know, that's, they didn't intend to reject us, but we felt rejected or we ourselves were careless with our words and we caused another person to feel rejected, but that wasn't our intention. So that's unintentional rejection. And then the last one, intentional rejection is motivated by ill will. It's just the person that has decided, I don't like you. I don't want to be around you. So I'm going to reject you. And, you know, we do it too to people, right? I'm not saying that we're always the victim because rejection is a two-way street. It just is. None of us are perfect people, perfect representation of God and his glory and his love. But uh, intentional rejection is motivated by, by ill will. And I think, I think they're all painful, but the intentional one and the perceived um, rejection have been probably the two areas where I've had to really struggle the most to overcome. Are there different stages of rejection? Different stages. You, you know, I think each personality is probably going to react to rejection a little bit differently. Sure. Um, but I like to say that there's a pattern that we deal with with rejection. And the, the first one is usually where we deal with the rejection between ourselves and another person. So we'll fixate on the on the event. We'll have imaginary conversations. You know, have you done that before where you have oh, I'm going to say this and they're going to say this and I'm going to nail them with this little zinger. And, or we imagine them coming to us and apologizing and we're, you know, so gracious to forgive them out of our, you know, bigness of heart. So we, we, we either fixate on the event and we replay it over and over again, or we have these pretend imaginary conversations. And then another way is sometimes we'll just avoid that person. We'll stop going to places where we are going to cross paths with the person that we, we feel rejected from. Now then the second stage or um, pattern is the words that we address to ourselves. So then we, we experience rejection and we fixate on the event and we're focusing on the other person. And then what happens then is we turn those thoughts towards ourself. And, and I, I've identified, I guess, three things that it's common for us to, how to treat ourselves. And number one, sometimes we feel shame. Like oh, I should have seen this coming. How could I have been so blind? you know, I was so dumb. I should have, I should have picked up on it, you know, years ago that this person was going to reject me five years later, you know? And so we're, 
we feel some shame because we didn't see it coming. So we couldn't like maneuver around it. Um, and then the other one is blaming ourselves. Uh, there must be something wrong with me. So we start, you know, looking at into ourselves and we think, ah, well, of course, why wouldn't anybody reject me? Look, I didn't think before I spoke and, you know, I was too blunt or I, I was too excitable and, and I know that bothers them or, you know, I was just too me. And so, the, so there must, it's all my fault. There's something wrong with me. And then sometimes we get into this victim mentality, especially if, if rejection has been a pattern in our life whether we have a behavior that needs refining under God's um, gracious, mighty hand and Holy Spirit, or we just are, it's like this, you know, lost little scruffy little feral cat that follows us through our lives. You know, we got to turn around and feed it. So the victim mentality shows up and wondering, well, why does this always have to happen to me? It happened again, so I might as well not try. I'm just a victim of rejection. And then the third stage or pattern is then we finally we look to God and we're like, well, Lord, you say you love me. So why didn't you do this? Why didn't you fix this? You know, you parted the Red Sea. Couldn't you have just prevented this from happening? I mean, you calm storms and now I'm in a storm and I've lost a relationship and or I've lost my dream or I am so disappointed. I thought you loved me. So so we, we have these stages and. And I want to challenge us to maybe flip that, where instead of starting with the person that, that we felt rejected with, we start with God. Mm -hmm. And we say, God, I'm hurt. I'm in pain. I really don't like this. I, I thought you were good and caring and kind, and, and I'm not seeing it here. And so we, we start with him. And we, we wrestle through those doubts and those questions with him and then we look at ourselves. then through his eyes we say okay not everyone's going to like me and that's going to be okay I'm not going to be perfect only Jesus is perfect and boy I'm not Jesus there's no way so why am I expecting myself to be perfect to give grace to make mistakes to give grace to self to realize you know I don't have to be responsible for everything that everybody else does or says or feeling, I just have to be responsible for my, my own responses. So what's in me that needs refining that, that will then help me forgive the, the person or the event that has happened. So those, those are our human way, I guess, of handling rejection. And then I propose that we try and flip it and we start with God then look at ourselves, and then look at others. What I especially love about your suggestion that we flip it is that it's de-emphasizing the other person because we don't have any control over them anyway. Right. And frequently they either did intend yep. to hurt or they don't know how to fix it. They don't even know that they've caused us to feel that way. But God saw the whole thing yeah. you know as we're interacting one-on-one -on -one with people we each have our our own perspective but by flipping it we're taking it to the lord and we're asking for his perspective yes i love yes. that yes. and that's a healthy way to deal with rejection friends we're going to take a real short commercial break but i don't want you to go anywhere because when we come back we're going to talk with jessica more about how to overcome rejection i think that this is something that i dare say all of us have dealt with to some degree now it may not affect all of us the same way but i love the direction of this conversation where we're talking about healthy ways to deal with rejection and we'll talk more on that when we come right back Welcome back to your hope-filled perspective, where today we are talking about how to overcome rejection. Right before the break, Jessica and I are talking about her suggestion for how we flip the scenario and how we flip, how we handle rejection and we take it to God first. But I want to remind us right now of 2 Corinthians 5, 17 that says, therefore, if anyone is in Christ, the new creation has come, 
the old has gone and the new is here. And this is such an appropriate verse for today's conversation because we started off the conversation talking about how that fear of rejection often stems from people pleasing and perfectionism. And we can do away with that when we receive God's perspective of us. So Jessica, I'm really curious, what are some ways our distorted view of rejection shows up in everyday life? Oh yeah, that is a good question. Well, a lot of times, we've touched on this already, we're driven by others' opinions. That, that's our drive. That's what we're seeking is someone's positive approval or positive opinion. And the negative opinions can either crush us or harden us, make us aggressive, cause us to give up. And so we allow other people's opinions too much power in our life. And we lose sight of what God is really calling us to do and to be. Another way that it shows up is an anxious heart where we wonder if it's really okay to show up as ourself or do we need to put on a mask? Mm. Now, I, I, I do think that, you know, cur common courtesy is not a mask. You know, giving someone the benefit of a doubt is not a mask. But there have been times where I've been pulled aside and said, hey, you know, I find it really intimidating that you're so good at just talking to people and working a room. And, you know, our friendship, I don't know if it can go forward since you're so good at that. And, and that created in me a real anxiety in my heart to, to wonder, is it okay if I show up like that? And so it, that disordered way can cause a little anxiety about, is it really okay to show up in the fullness of who God has created me to be? But Another way- Like is, that, don't you think that comments like that reveal more about the other person? Yes, yes. You know, as a midlife person now, I can look, that was in college, and I can look back at that with, with a lot more perspective, um, a better perspective, but, at, but it's, I, I still hear it. I hear it in my mind to this day. When I enter a room, I'm like, ooh, is it okay? Is it okay if I, you know, just be me? <laughs> so, but that's, so the fear of rejection can cause us to really question um, whether or not we should show up. Another thing is then is that it also breeds some doubt. Like I mentioned earlier, we can doubt God's love and goodness and care for us when, we ex when we're afraid is rejection going to happen. And we can also doubt ourselves and our interactions with, with others. You know, we can second guess, we can, we can replay those conversations. Of, oh, should I have really have said that? I don't know if I should have said that. And then we can spend an hour or two, or at least I can, mulling it over and, you know, chewing on it, like, excuse me, like a cow, you know, chewing on its cud, or, you know, I'm just going to chew on it like a piece of gum until it loses all of its flavor. So, so this fear of rejection can really drive us to doubt ourselves and other people's interactions with us. And then I do think we can lean towards controlling when we're afraid of rejection, mm -hmm. we, uh, I found that I try and control my circumstances or the way people perceive me and, and controlling, uh, I don't know. That's a whole nother subject. Probably it is. when we live life trying to control outcomes, whoo, you know, that can make us impossible to be around. It can, we can end up with impossible standards. And we, we lose the ability to go with the flow <laughs> and to trust God that he can use everything for our good. And I'm sitting here wondering if, if someone has dealt with a lot of rejection, whether it is actual or it's perceived, I would imagine then there's going to be a greater tendency to project the possibility for rejection into new relationships. Absolutely. And I think that stems out of that fear that you were talking about. Because we have experienced it before, it's horrible and nobody wants to experience it again. 
but I think to some degree that can set up a self-fulfilling prophecy because then we could behave in ways Mm -hmm. that prompt others rejections. Absolutely. Yes. This is a vicious cycle. It is a vicious cycle. So then let's talk about how do we break the cycle of rejection? Oh, I love talking about breaking cycles. That is just, it's possible, it's doable, but in order to break a cycle, you have to start from the inside out. We can't just apply behaviors without really addressing what's in our heart and mind. You know, Jesus told the Samaritan woman that we need to worship him in spirit and in truth. And, and there's times, I don't know about anybody else, but a lot of times I'll, I'll, my brain will say, I believe God, but my heart is screaming, no, you don't, no, uh no, no way. Or it'll be the other way around where my heart's like, oh, I'm worshiping you, Lord. And my, my mind is going, really? <laughs> I'm kind of distracted about the grocery list right now. You know? <laughs> and so if we really want to break a cycle, we have to start from the inside. So really the first step is to really be aware of your thoughts. Be aware of your thoughts. Pay attention to the, to the thoughts that go through your mind. Then secondly, capture them before they can even singer their way into your heart like a little arrow. And and so the way I do that is I'm like, ooh, if I wouldn't say this thought out loud to my friend, then I should not be saying it to myself. So be aware and capture, Mm -hmm. be aware and capture. Then that's not, you can't just stop there because we have to replace them. And so the next thing is, is we, we make our thoughts obedient and we change our thoughts. And what I mean by that is um, just like we wouldn't say to our friend, well, of course you're not worthy. You know, we're not going to say that to ourselves, but instead we need to say, I am worthy. God, God said I was worthy. He sent his son to die for me. That makes me worthy of his love and goodness. So then we change our thoughts and then we need to think then after we change our thoughts, think on what we want to be. You know, if, if we have a behavior pattern, like self-fulfilling prophecy of rejecting, you know, what, what is it that we're doing? Do we come across as gruff? Do we come across as, you know, how you put up those protective defenses and Mm you can be a little prickly? Well, you know, maybe you want to focus on being gentle instead. And so that's a way that you can think on what you want to be. Think about being forgiving. Think about being accepting. Think about being gracious. Think about that instead of, oh, they're never going to like me. Well, I'm going to be gracious instead. And then our minds are a noisy place. So we need to practice quiet, you know, just to, to be still and know that he is God really involves not just physically being still, but quieting our minds. We need to just be still. Stop the hamster wheel of those negative thoughts. And then when we do that, we're then able to to really meditate on the truth of God's word. And then when we're ready to meditate, it's easier to receive what he says about us. Mm -hmm. So we have to be still so we can receive. And then I do think we need to use our spiritual weapons. We are more than conquerors, right? God has given us the sword of the spirit. We can use the name of Jesus to rebuke our enemy. And sometimes the enemy uses those stray little thoughts that come across, or he uses someone who looks side-eyed at us. You know, they're not really looking at us. They're thinking about that, you know, that messy garbage that mess that their cat made or something that they had to clean up but we take that that side-eyed view as like ew they don't like me wait a minute in the name of jesus i rebuke that thought that doesn't glorify him and it doesn't reveal that person as made in the image of god either so we use our spiritual weapons and then we receive grace you know god makes it so i love i love hebrews 4 12 through 16 where it talks about how because of Jesus, we can come to the throne of God to receive grace. And so we need to receive that grace. We're going to make mistakes. We're going to reject others. We're going to feel rejected by others. But grace, 
grace is the way through. We can receive God's grace through Lord Jesus, forgive me for rejecting that person or Lord Jesus, forgive me for wanting revenge on a person that rejected me. And we receive his grace. And then we walk boldly. We have to walk, walk as accepted and chosen and loved and treasured by God. And when we walk in that, our faith is activated, right? And we walk forward because faith prompts action and action builds our faith. Yes. And I look at Noah and Abraham and Moses and Joshua, and I think about the faith that it took them to walk boldly into the unknown, really. And when we break cycles, we're really walking into the unknown because we're, we're, we're rejecting our default reactions. And we're saying, God, I want to go a new way. I want a new journey. Such good practical tips. Friends, we're going to take a real quick commercial break, but stick with us because when we come back, I'm going to ask Jessica to share her hope-filled perspective. We'll be right back. Welcome back to your hope-filled perspective where today we have been talking about how to overcome rejection. And Jessica, what I would love the most is your practical tips for how do we overcome that and starting from the inside out. I think that's so crucial because we can't change other people. We can only change ourselves. And even then, we can only do so much of that without the Holy Spirit's help. So your focus and your reliance on being who God says we are, instead of focusing on who other people say we are, is so crucial for overcoming that cycle. But if a listener is listening to our conversation today and maybe they've experienced the pain of rejection and they're feeling it, what hope-filled perspective would you want to leave them with today? I would want them to know that God has not forgotten you. That he is with you in the pain. He is with you in the tears. He is with you in the struggle to forgive. He is carrying you. He is caring for you. And that he's not going to leave you and he's not going to forsake you, but he's going to show you how much he cares and loves for you as he walks you through this. Going through hard times in life does not mean that God is not blessing you. It actually is meaning that he He's going to demonstrate his faithfulness to you. He's going to say, child, daughter of mine, I love you with an everlasting love. And I know that your heart is breaking and I know that you are in pain, but I am with you. Hold my hand and trust me as we walk forward. Come sit with me and let me minister to your heart and let me be the one that you turn to for your worth and your sense of self. I have good plans for you. And they involve walking forward in faith and boldness with me. Beautiful. Friends, it's my prayer that something in our conversation today has resonated with you. Either because you felt rejected or you've witnessed someone rejecting someone else. But I hope that by talking about these different types of rejection and how to break the cycle, that that will encourage your heart. I want to remind you of a couple of verses that come from 1 Peter 2, verses 9 to 10, that says, but you are a chosen people, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, God's special possession. I want you to hear that you are God's special possession, that you may declare the praises of him who called you out of darkness into his wonderful light. Once you were not a people, but now you are a people of God. Once you had not received mercy, but now you have received mercy. It's my prayer that you receive that today for whatever you're going through. 
with whomever you're going through it. And remember that your heavenly father's perspective is so much more important than your own or anyone else's. Mm -hmm. This has been another episode of your hope-filled perspective. If something in this episode resonated with you today, would you consider sharing it with a friend who perhaps needs to remember that they are still worthy, they are still loved, they have received mercy from the Father. And while you're at it, consider subscribing to the program so you don't miss another episode of your hope-filled perspective. Jessica, I thank you for being on the program and sharing out of your own hurt and pain to encourage our listeners who are there now. Friends, until next week when we meet again, it's my prayer for you that you have a hope-filled week.